some of these away. <laughs> I'm assuming there's nobody else. If they do, they'll have to come in halfway through and tough. <laughs> My name's Derek Woodroff. Um, I've built a hell of a lot of stuff with Raspberry Pis, but the latest one um, is my fixie clock, which has usually just died. I don't like the timing. You can't trust IT, can you? So, the fixie clock. Why? I was sat at home, and I had a few OLED displays. Now, I assume you all know what OLED displays are, they're fairly boring, these particularly boring black and white displays, I had about five or six of them, and I was wondering something to do with them. Anybody on Twitter? Silence. Oh no, a couple, a couple. Have you heard of Make Vember? A friend of mine runs Make Vember every year, strangely enough in November. Come on in, you're welcome. Sit down, we won't make fun. No, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> And so every, every November, he just runs a little thing on Twitter to post your builds. And the whole idea of that is you start with something you've never done before um, and just play with it. So I've never driven these OLEDs before and I wanted to play with making a fake Nixie clock. I'll come into what a Nixie is later on. I'm a fan of steampunk, so Nixies and steampunk tend to go together, having that sort of retro uh, kind of vibe, especially as they're valves. The other thing that I realised is that using OLEDs is probably a better way. The Nixie tubes are from the 70s. They, they require 300 odd volts for them to run and quite a complicated driver, where OLEDs are really, really simple. Four wires, I squared C, you've got a display. And I needed something that I could build in small steps. This is because of that. If any of you have had a puppy, you will realise that doing anything for any long periods of time gets very, very difficult. That is a small German Shepherd. He's now quite a big German Shepherd. So I needed something I could do with loads of little, little hits. So we started with the Nixie Club. So the other OLED displays. There are some, if you haven't seen them before, they are very, very cheap. From China, you can get them for uh, around three, four pounds each. In fact, if you get them in bulk, you can get them even cheaper than that. Um, they're quite nice little displays that will give you, um, I can't actually remember what the resolution is now, it's uh, about 600 by 400 pixels, something like that. But they are totally black and white. No grayscale, just on and off, which makes them pretty hideous, really. When, when you're running them, there's no, there's no ice, nice edges to any of your fonts or anything else. They are on and off. Um, but they're cheap. They have no high voltage. They're easy to drive with I squared C. A couple of the problems with them, though. Although they sit on I squared bus, there are only two options for an address, which means you can only have two on your I squared C bus. The actual display of themselves aren't actually central to the display itself. That comes with a bit of a problem later on when I'm trying to do something with them. And they are by default in landscape. So that means that you need to run them like that one and not like these two. So you've got to get around that in software. So, for the ones of you that don't know what a Nixie is, that is a Nixie tube. And that is not a very good photo, I apologise for it being so fuzzy, that's because it comes from the 70s. It's my excuse, I'm sticking with it. A Nixie tube is a valve, it is filled with um, neon and or other rare gases. And as you can see, there are a set of wires in there. And literally you apply a high voltage to the wire, the wire glows in the shape of whatever number and that's what gives you the numbers from 0 to 7. You can actually see the wires that aren't lit. So if you look at that, there's a 9, there's a 0, there's an 8. And they are there most of the time. The other thing is they have depth. Because the wires are one in front of the other, 
Number one is probably, I think I was at the back by the looks of that, because you can see everything else in front of it. Nought is a bit further down the stack, seven is nearer the front. So you actually see the wires both behind and in front of the one that's lit. But at the time, that was the only way you could do this. Is before LEDs were very common, um, and it was a, a gobsmacking piece of technology in the 60s, 70s. Aesthetically, they are quite pleasing. They're, they're, they're quite nice to the eye. A little less harsh than LED displays, I think, personal opinion. So that's what an Ixa tube is. So my aim was to try and duplicate that aesthetic. Now, a couple of problems here. I know about as much about glass blowing, well I know absolutely nothing about glass blowing, so I wasn't going to try and make any of my own glass. But I managed to find a jam jar, although hexagonal, that would actually work. I tried the round jam jars, but they distorted the fruit too much, so you, you couldn't see the numbers. And all I did was put a, a, a grid, laser cut, on the front of the OLED display. That's one with just the grid laser cut. And then you can see there, what I've actually done is laser etched the rest of those numbers in there. So that when you put it in front of the display, you get the display and you get all the wires and it looks like there is a, a, a cathode grid from an actual mixer tube in there. And I think they, they look quite effective. But of course now you're then going to mount your jam jars so they don't look like jam jars. So I set them down into a, um, a recessed area um, and laser cut some supports for the fake mixes. So you can see you've got a piece of MDF supporting it. That's the OLED display there. And then just one piece of acrylic laser etched with the, uh, the front on them. So, I then came to another little problem. If you remember, I, I said about the problems of the i squared c displays. You can only get two on each i squared c bus. Which means that you can only have a clock that display, display two digits. Which, that would work very well. You need really six. You will notice I've got five. As I said, I only got five OLED displays, but I wanted six, and I wanted seconds. So I cheated with the seconds a bit. In fact, I cheated with the seconds quite a lot. I did a double digit for the seconds. So I display a landscape to give me a bit more space, put the two digits next to each other, and then laser etched it as if they were together. This has one brilliant effect that I wasn't expecting. There are people who are fanatics about Nixie tubes, and they come up to the clock and go, where did you get a double digit Nixie tube from? <laughs> I haven't told them yet. <laughs> it really blows their minds, because for that to happen, you'd actually have to have 21 wires stuck out to the bottom of this valve, and it would be huge. So, yeah, a little bit of interest for the, uh, for the, the older geeks out there who know about Nixies. So, then down to a bit more probably what you guys are used to. Got a Raspberry Pi Zero running the whole lot. Got that little board there, which is an I squared C multiplexer. What that does is, from the one I squared C channel into the Raspberry Pi, it gives me the ability to address eight other I squared C channels. Which then means I can have two displays on each of those eight channels. So that gives me the option of addressing 16 nixes, or fixes, I should say. Obviously, I only need five, but that instantly gets around the problem with you having two, um, only two I squared C channels for each um, OLED display. Those are the OLEDs, as you've seen before just mounted, and then we've got this little board here. 
That is a solenoid driver, and I will come back to why that's there in a minute. So the software was actually fairly simple. For the time, I didn't bother with a, um, a real-time clock board. It would have been easy to have put one on, but my house has got so much Wi-Fi in it, you really don't need it. So I just let it connect to my Wi-Fi. The Raspberry Pi grabs its time from um, NTP, as a normal Raspberry Pi does, zero setting up, and it just works. Downside is when you bring it to somewhere like this and it, it can't see my Wi-Fi, I have to tell it what the time is. That's rare, luckily. Um, <clears throat> the other driver software, Adafruit, do a lovely little piece of, um, a lovely little library for driving those little um, displays. And I hold my hand up, I didn't buy the displays from Adafruit, I got them from China. I'm not going to tell you why, you can guess. Adafruit do like to charge for the stuff they buy from China. Then again, they provide free libraries. I've just advertised them four or five times to you guys, please use Adafruit, because I use their libraries. There you go, that's my yeah. <laughs> open source bit done. I to see multiplex driver, Adafruit do that as well. I got that one from Pimeroni. I buy a lot of stuff from Pimeroni, they are absolutely brilliant. They do all the software for that, and that is the, the library I use. I'm sure you can buy that from China. It's just they're not a nice little one. The fonts for the, um, the actual tubes, I found that on Google Fonts there is a Nixie tube font. Now, isn't that a win? So, I just used it. It's simple as that. It's superb. It looks brilliant. The only problem I had was, it being a proper true, true type font, it's actually got an outline and not one wire. Which is fine for the OLED displays, but I wanted to use the same font to etch those filters. And it gave me double digits because you've got an inner and an outer from the font. Eventually I found that the Eggbot project did a single stroke font. So the X digits on the, on the um, filters are actually using the um, Eggbot's single digit font rather than Google's font. Um, it was easier to use Google Fonts to the OLED because the Adafruit OLED driver by default can use any true type font, so I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And there's also a, a degree of in image manipulation. I tweak the display of the numbers uh, depending on which number is being displayed so that it matches up with the etched front. I scale them um, and I also flip them 90 degrees to get them from uh, landscape to portrait so that you can get the maximum amount of area on the display as, as possible. And that's just done with the, the Python PIL library. So, I said there was a solenoid driver. In the back of the clock is a solenoid and that there is a piece of what is now brass um, rod. You've got a clock, it's got to, it's got to go long, hasn't it? <laughs> so, solenoid hits that, hours, number <coughs> hours every and on the hour, and so it bongs rather quietly and it does have a bit of a clonk. Um, I'm actually in discussion with a few people on Twitter about how to improve the clonk. Um, apparently, putting a piece of leather on the, on the back of that solenoid so that it doesn't hit with quite a metal-to-metal -metal, um, contact improves things. At the moment, that hits at less than 10 milliseconds to try and get, get around the problem. Um, but that's either very, very quiet or a clonk. You can't win. So that's still a bit of a, bit of a work in progress. So, you've got a nice looking clock, you want a case for it. MDF laser cut, 
um, stained with a dark oak wood stain, um, and then just the embossed bits filled with acrylic paint. Really that simple. All I did after making the box, because it was all done with tabs, I did put a little piece of brass around the outside just to try and hide the tabs, which as you can see there, I didn't do particularly well. So I got the wrong size of brass. Such is life. The other thing that the clock does that is going a little more geeky. I run a company that has a number of servers that have to be up 24-7. This sits in my living room. Um, so what I actually use is the very last display, the seconds display, to give me host and service alerts uh, from my servers. So I can be sat in the room and quite inoffensively the clock is saying I'll an H to say there's a host down or an S to say that there is a server down. That flicks between seconds and displaying that uh, once every five seconds. So normally it displays seconds, then it'll just flick to an H for a second and go back again. Most people don't even notice it's there. If you look at the one in the other room, it's doing that now, but it'll be going XX. The reason it's doing XX is because it can't see my servers at the moment. And it'll sit there and it'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, XX, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, XX. So you've got just a, a subtle display that I need to actually get off my backside and go and fix some servers. So, I'm Derek Woodruff. You can get me Twitter, either Extreme Kits or Extilec. Any questions? Stunned silence. How are you getting the data from the Agios server to your clock? Oh, that's a completely different talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, it uses the Nagios API, okay. and I've written a Python script to extract the host and service data out of it. Um, I've actually got another one that sits in my computer room that is um, eight neopixels, so you get host, service, and it's a complete display of sort of eight or eight or nine different things. I mean, if you're interested in the code, give me a shout. I can uh, you know, check it all out. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Including the puppy. Well, I'm still training the puppy now, so. <laughs> um, I started it. For May November, I did between a half an hour and an hour every night, and it was mostly finished by the 20th, so between 10 and 15 hours, I would guess. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So if you want to pick, if you want to pick my brains, I'm going to be uh, stood out there until 3 o'clock or so, so just come and ask. Thank you very much for letting me bore you senseless. <laughs>